Welcome to Chatbox, everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm David Cruz from NJTV News. Want to say a special hello to those of you who are already in the chat box. I see Willie already in there. We will be taking questions from the chat box. So once you get on and uh, start watching the, the stream, you can ask questions from the chat box. Your moderator there is- Welcome Tim to Chatbox, Nelson. everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm David Cruz from NJTV I'm News. Want to say a special hello. Right here to because I'm getting some feedback, but let's go now and welcome to our program, Senate President Steve Sweeney. Senator, welcome to the program. Thanks for doing this, man. Uh, thanks for having me, David. So how, how are you doing? How's the family and, and how's the district? You know, we're doing okay, you know, and down here in the south, southern part of the state, it's not nearly as the challenge that you had up north. You know, and we pray for you. We pray for everybody. You know, it's 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 a little hectic down here, but most most of the fatalities are nursing homes, you know, which is being seen around the state. Um, excited the governor allowed uh, beaches to open up coming up Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so I think, you know, we're pretty much ready, David, to get going. In the district, is this what people are are still, I mean, is this mostly what people are talking about to you in the district? People want to start, they want to know what's going on. They want, when can we start? You know, you have businesses that are calling me on a regular basis. Look, government's putting me out of business. I can operate my business. I can follow the rules. See, Delaware just opened up, David. So they, if, if you want a haircut, you know, we have cars. You can drive over to Delaware to get a haircut. You can't get one here. There's things you can buy there that you can't get here. Pennsylvania has a whole lot of uh, different businesses that are opened up that we don't have opened up. And, you know, you have other states that are opening up by region. New York's doing it. Pennsylvania's doing it. And honestly, you know, you know, the numbers are low down here. So the percentage is a little bit higher than average, but the numbers are lower than every, you know, it's, 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 it, look, this, 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 this virus is horrible. It's a killer, but it, it, we've been okay down here so far. Just so people know, I mean, South Jersey, in case a lot of people don't get down there, is a little different from uh, uh, us up here, we're kind of all on top of each other. The South is a little uh, spread out. And so you can, uh, it's a little easier to, to be socially distant from one another. So that's why when you, when you say it's not as bad down there, that's yeah. part of the reason why, yeah. Well, you know, David, you know, just the, the, way, the, the way the communities were built, you know, you guys are packed in up, up, up North um, and down here we're spread out, you know, I mean, you know that, the most populous down, town down here is probably Cherry Hill with 2,500 people per square mile. Up in north, we got 60 towns in, in the northern part of the central part of the state. That, people on my block. Yeah, well, they, David, let me tell you something. There's towns that have 841, 800, 8,411 people per square mile. You know what I mean? And I learned that when we were doing the Verizon uh, Fio stuff. You know, you know, that they had to go to those towns that were populated. Well, I can take you places in, in my district that don't have cable yet. Yeah. You know? So let me tell you how this works. We've been soliciting questions from our listeners all week. Uh, so we have some of those. I have a few questions. And uh, folks who are watching right now uh, on our YouTube stream are in the chat box, and they will be answering some questions or asking some questions uh, during the program. So we're going to jump around a lot. So sure. let's start with with the governor and how he's been handling this. He was on this program uh, last week. We had uh, Judy Persicelli, um, and she was uh, she's the commissioner of uh, health for the state of New Jersey. And they have those daily uh, press briefings. And so they have really kind of been controlling the narrative uh, when it comes to this issue. And I wonder if you feel like the legislature has been a bit marginalized as a result of, particularly with the executive orders that the the chief executive has been putting out there. Now, you know, David, the governor is doing what he feels is necessary to keep the people of the state safe. Uh, you know, would we like to be included more at times? Yes, of course we would. You know, we're doing voting sessions to try to advance legislation that that the, we feel the governor needs to move forward. Uh, we think we should be a, a little bit more in the more on the end. Of course we should. You know, we've asked for 
the modeling that he, you know, how he talks about modeling. We've asked for a month, show us the models. Maybe we won't complain as much. You know what I mean? If you show us the information that you're working off of, but look, the government did a great job, really did, bringing the curve down, keeping people safe. Frustration is because we're not seeing what he's saying and what we're seeing is things are getting better. We wanna know why we can't open up when, when this consortium of states is opening up all around us. What's the consultation been like? I know even before this crisis, you know, most legislat uh, legislators that I spoke to were not too happy with how the front office had been communicating with them. And just talking to folks during the past week, lawmakers, they say that nothing has really changed. What kind of consultation have you had and, and, and the leadership had with the governor? Well, well, the speaker and I have met with the governor, I think, three times in the last month. Uh, you know, just basic conversation, not a whole lot of detail on anything. We'll get a phone call 15 minutes before they're going to announce an executive order or something they're going to do. Um, so so we don't complain that we're reading about it before they told us. But, uh, you know, what I would really like to be able to do, David, and I've asked for a month, is share with the legislative leadership, Democrats, Republicans, modeling is helping you make these decisions. Because again, David, I might be, I could be a thousand percent wrong and I'm asking him to open up car sales, which for, for the life of me, I don't know why they won't do it. You know, it's, it's a big parking lot. You know, I don't think there's any risk at all, but, and it's a big sales tax generator. That's why I'm talking about car sales. Uh, we're glad that the governor is going to do is uh, giving guidance on elective surgery. He announced that today. You know, we've been pre pre pressing for that. So, look, we want to see the economy start opening up, and using his words, with a dimmer switch. Not, and I agree with that. No, no flipping the switch. But let's start opening up. Let's measure, and then keep up opening up some more because people have. I don't think people recognize how bad things are going to be. You know, right now people. Are, or unemployment, the ones that can get it, and they're getting extra money. You know, like a lot of people are getting more money to stay home than if they were working. That's not going to last forever, David. And then when you think you can go back to your job, it's not going to be there. That's my concern if we don't up the economy. I'm reading this week uh, in NorthJersey.com, I don't know if you saw this, a report on the governor has all of these task force and committees who are advising him yet there's there's no record of anything that they've discussed there's no record of uh what meetings they've had there's no records of what went on at these meetings and nobody seems to know what kind of advice the governor has been getting and none of the information that's exchanged at these committee meetings is operable yeah. so is that transparency in your mind no nah, david uh we're going to need more transparency as we go forward in this crisis. Because if you remember during Sandy, we made sure there was a, lo a load of transparency, especially when it came to the money that came with Sandy. We thought that was important. The CARES Act is going to be bringing a lot of money into the state. And there should be a mechanism for people to say, oh, they spent so much on this or they spent so much on that. It's not a criticism, but I think people like to know where the money's going. And, and does it concern you that none of the information from these meetings is being made public at all? I, yes, I, I would expect that they'll come out with a report. My question, really, David, was why do you need 300 people to advise to make a decision? You know, the CDC is giving guidelines for pretty much every single business that's out there. And you, we should be telling businesses, if you can follow the CDC guidelines, and open safely, you know, then open. You know, I was watching last night on, on another news uh, station, national news station, they were in Georgia, people were in restaurants. You know what I mean? They, they, they distanced the restaurants. It was weird to look at, you know, seeing waiters with gloves and masks, and, you know, but people with tables, you know, six, eight feet apart with plants blocking them. Uh, there's a way to get moving again. And I, I really think CDC guidelines are, are the, the gold standard and we should follow it. All right, we're gonna talk about business in a little bit. Let's get to some questions from uh, chat box. Uh, this is Barb. Hi, Barb. Barb wants to know, what would you 
do differently from the governor regarding any actions against uh, COVID-19? Are there some policy things that you would just do differently right off the bat? Listen, you know, it's this, this is an unfair question because it's Monday morning quarterbacking. Yep. And it's, it's easy to criticize when you see where mistakes were made. Uh, so look, first, it's not a fair question, but, but I'm gonna answer the question. Uh, nursing homes, we didn't, we didn't react quickly enough. More than half the deaths, we have the highest percentage of deaths in the country in our nursing homes. Our, our jails have the worst percentage of deaths. Realize these are people that aren't going out and getting it. It's, most of those, all those things are true right now. What would you have done differently? Well, you know, some David, I don't think I would have ordered this nursing home to, to take corona, coronavirus patients and move them around. You know, I, I again, it's Monday morning quarterbacking. It's not fair, and it's not a criticism of the governor. If we were taking a review of it now, we wouldn't have ordered uh, March 31st, the governor did an executive order you know, on, on coronavirus patients in nursing homes. Uh, Andrew Cuomo did it the week before. Cuomo is now saying, thinks it might've been a mistake. Well, I think it was a mistake, but again, it's easy to say that at this point. Uh, you know, developmental centers, David, I got involved in politics because my daughter, you know that. Yeah. Developmental centers, uh, group homes, didn't have any PPE. They were the last ones to receive it and realize these are the people with the compromised immune systems. So, and the workers that work in nursing homes, the workers working in group homes are low paid workers. So normally they're not just working at one location, they're working at a couple places. So the potential to spread and make people sick is even greater. So, you know, they're talking about testing everyone now going into nursing homes, but it's kind of like, you know, closing the door after the horse got out, you know, the barn door after the horse got out. But again, that I want to be clear because this is not a criticism of the government. This is if you're doing a recap, there was mistakes. Right. And I would imagine that at some point when this is all over, whenever that's going to be, there's going to be a lot of postmortems and uh, people are going to be talking about should we have done this? And maybe we could have done this differently. And all of you are going to be involved in that, I'm assuming. Yeah, and I, I like to say post-op. Okay. Because, because post-mortem is yeah. with what's going on. Yes. Uh, you know, I listen, David, when, once this is all done, we got to do a deep dive to see what we did well. Because there's things the governor did very well and what we didn't do well so that we can move forward and lay a blueprint for the future you know, the next generations, God, God forbid we have to deal with something like this again. But at least we have some kind of plan in place so that you would know how to act. You know, the biggest problem is you know, this pandemic was, was, was predicted for two decades. And no one did anything, you know, Democrats and Republicans to make sure the stockpiles were large enough and replenished on a regular basis. You know, one, other, one, one thing I, I hope comes out of this is manufacturing of PPE in the state. We shouldn't be relying on foreign countries. We should be, you know, propping up some manufacturers with tax credits to, you know, to be the PPE, you know, providers for the state of New Jersey. That's the jobs program right there. Let me move on to uh, Terrell, who asks from the chat box, how is the state going to make money? I mean, that that goes to the whole budget question, which we're going to get to in a minute. But, you know, something we make money when we have businesses open. And yeah. businesses could sell products. And because people, right now, besides the people that don't have their own employment, and believe me, David, my phone rings all day long with people. We try to get them help. But the people that are collecting have actually more money than they normally had. So there's money to be had and money to be spent. But if there's businesses aren't open, you know, we, there's no sales tax to collect. So we really do need to find ways to start opening things up. And, you know, the governor did open up curbside pickups. Again, thank you. It's helpful, but we need more. All right, let me move on to another question. This one uh, from an email. Sorry, I'm moving around this screen just like uh, a pro today for some reason. All right, let me get to my questions and we'll get back to the screen in a second. Let's talk about what I thought was the big news of, of the week and it came today 
um, when the governor announced that the July primary is going to be almost entirely vote by mail. Uh, and this comes in the light of what was a debacle uh, in Patterson, where I think it was something like 900 mail-in ballots uh, had to be thrown out and their election was entirely vote by mail. Um, I, I talked to the mayor today, Andre Say there. He said democracy uh, is in danger. Um, do you have any confidence that the state's going to be able to pull off uh, a primary, primarily vote by mail? I'm hoping. I'm hoping. We didn't have, we, look, we had, we had some bad spots and not one vote should ever be lost. Not one, David. You know, everyone's voice should be heard. And uh, it's kind of a hybrid, you know what I mean? Because you're going to be voting provisional, provisional, which means you'll be, able, you'll be able to go to a voting place, you know, and you'll be able to go to a vote to a place to vote and deliver your vote. So it's yeah, it's a paper ballot. But you know, David, the other thing we have to be concerned with, you know, most of our poll workers are elderly people. You know that, and safety can't be lost over elections either. We got to learn how to conduct elections. You know, other states do it electronically. I think Oregon does it all electronically, you know, and some states are all pay, all mail-in ballot. Um, you know, I thought we had a good mix between mail-in and in-person. I personally, David, have voted mail-in for the last 10 years. Yeah, you know, though, um, the governor said that there's gonna be at least one polling place in every town. I think of a place like Jersey City, where we are right now, or Newark, uh, which is flat and spread out. And if you're in the South Ward, how are you going to make it all the way to the North Ward, the end of the North Ward, just to cast your ballot? I mean, that's going to be really tough. I, there is not a lot of optimism out there about how this is going to uh, go down. Well, hopefully the governor is going to think even further through this because, you know, it's possible that you can have a collection you can have collection boxes at your municipal buildings, David, you know, or at certain public buildings throughout the town where you can have the collection box where you can drop it, you know, like a, like a mailbox or any kind of collection box. Like we have a county store down where I live in a mall. And you, when you go to vote there, they got a, they got a lock box. You know, there's locks on it, you drop the ballot in it. So maybe the, hopefully it'll think, think it through even further to provide more opportunities. So as you said, about this too newark all the people in newark you got one place to go to that's going to bring crowds you know and i just think of you know uh patterson this week and you know just last year there was a conviction of a of a guy in in hoboken um who had been you know harvesting uh vote by mails and and paying people to vote by mail and you know, if you see a bundle of these vote by mail, you know, somebody's out there harvesting, harvesting vote by mail applications. And that's serious danger. David, listen, you know, it's been legendary in Atlantic City. You hear, you've heard about that for years in Atlantic that's City. It. And, you know, what you don't want is for someone to be able to steal an election by cheating with the vote by mails. Again, I'm a big vote by mail proponent because I've been doing it myself for years. But I think having the option of in-person or vote by mail is not a bad system. All right, Brenda is in the chat. Um, she opens the can of worms that we'll spend a couple minutes on now. Uh, what about NJ Transit? How do you keep that system running safely? Uh, New Jersey needs mass transit to reopen. I'm thinking once we reopen and people have to go into work into Manhattan, you know, before this crisis began, people were standing in the aisles, you know, and every seat was taken. That's just, how's that going to work? Well, you know, David, and remember, while this was going on, those they hadn't taken the necessary corrections, you know, to try to space it out because we don't have enough of it. But I, I honestly, I think we need transit people to run transit. You know, uh, you know, Kevin Corbett's a nice man. He's not a mass transit person. He came from um, the uh, this like the the offshore, you know, the the shipping industry. Yeah. You know, you need transit people to run a transit agency. Period. 
Am I hearing you say that Kevin Corbett's got to go? You're hearing me say that Kevin Corbett, he can be the executive, but he has to surround himself with transit people. Because, you know, listen, at the end of the day, you need transit people to run transit. And that's one of the problems that we have. You know, when we had when we had the hearing with him, when we had the hearing with him, David, and he chose not to bring people with him and he couldn't answer questions and or he tried to slide past questions. It was crystal clear to me when he came to the hearing that he's not a transit person. He might be a great manager, but, you know, you don't and you don't have to be the expert at something, but make sure you surround yourself with experts. And let's face it, NJ Transit is a disaster. And we need to fix it. And again, you can't blame this administration. This is decades in the making. Decades in the making. You know, I can tell you, Ronnie Hakem, who was running it before, she was a transit person. So much so, when she went to New York, a lot of the town people at NJ Transit followed her. There. Yeah. We, we uh, heard this week that the governor then uh, withdrew two nominations uh, to the board, which he's supposed to have completed back in, I guess, 2018, when the NJ Transit Reform Bill uh, passed. Um, one of those people, Janet Chernitz, I mean, if you want to talk about a, a transit expert, there's one right there. And so she's not going to be serving on that board, at least for the foreseeable future. They should have never did that, David. And when, you know, there was no excuse for pulling her nomination. She's probably the most qualified one that was nominated. And, you know, so it really was no excuse to pull her. And, and uh, hopefully they'll renominate her. You know, it took us a while, you know, to get her up in, in position to go on that board. And you know who suffers for her not being on that board? The people that ride NJ Transit. Not it is good. clear and it, it, I don't see, or I should just ask you, if you see that changing anytime soon. Listen, I, I, I'm going to take the governor or his staff at their words that they're going to re-nominate her. But listen, they've thrown roadblocks when Bob Gordon was going to go on the board. They came up with reasons for Bob Gordon not to be able to serve. Senator Gordon, who's a VPU commissioner. And they gave an excuse that there was a, there was a statute or a rule where they couldn't serve. Well, two, BP, two other BPU commissioners were serving on boards that they weren't allowed to serve on. So, you know, listen, we want qualified people to go on and we want what that board needs to be a board that speaks for the commuters, the commuters, because, you know, NJ Transit is critical for the economy of this state, especially where you live. You know, I tell people I'd like to have a little bit of NJ Transit down by me. When we see a bus going by, we get excited down where I live. Let's take a couple minutes and talk about um, business uh, and restarting this economy. Um, the governor kind of opened the door. He, he said that uh, the beaches will open, and that's a big part of the state's economy. Um, but it's not entirely a reopening of the beaches because they're going to be limited in terms of uh, how many people can be there, how many badges they can sell. Uh, and not all of the amusements will be open at places like Seaside, and where amusements are a big part of that economy. Has he gone far enough in your mind? Uh, to reopen business in New Jersey? Well, again, with the shore, with the shore uh, communities being able to open up, and I think he's done the right, he's got the right balance when you're talking boardwalks and beaches. Uh, I, would, I would hope that he would look at Cape May's reopening plan. They did a great reopening plan. So did Atlanta County. That he would look at those counties that are dealing with this to open up what they can. But, you know, David, think about it. You know, kids next to each other with, you know, shooting the guns, the water pistols. And, you know, there's realities of things. We're not going back to the new normal. This, this is not the normal. It's, good. it's a hybrid of what's normal. But the fact that he's giving people the sense of hope, and I, and I appreciate that, saying, hey, listen, the beaches will be open. And, you know, it won't be what it was, but we're getting there. You know, if people are depressed, there's a lot of mental anxiety in the state because people are just you know, they're scared. So this is giving people hope. And I, and I appreciated the governor opening it up. Uh, Liz Moyle was on with our uh, Rhonda Schaffler this week. And she said that the state is anticipating over 20 and 21, a 10 
$10 billion shortfall, $10 billion on a $40 billion budget. That seems like a catastrophe waiting to happen. Now, uh, our John Reitmeyer of NJ Spotlight said that it may not be exactly uh, 10 billion, but even if it's 5 billion, that's, that's a big chunk out of a, a state budget. W what are you guys gonna do about that? Well, first, we're gonna hope Senator Menendez is, is successful in his, in his efforts to ensure the states and government and county and local governments get help because it's not a red state, blue state. We got a lot of states in this position right now. And just like when we got hit with Sandy, money came into this state to help us rebuild. We're gonna need help and not to pay our legacy costs. We gotta deal with our pensions. We got, you know, our, our legacy cost issues are our legacy cost issues. But there's no way any state's going to be able to survive without assistance. Let's say that doesn't happen or that it doesn't happen to the extent that you would like to see. A couple of things. One, are, are we going to see cuts in services and the um, cuts in terms of um, uh, uh, the number of state employees and higher taxes? Wh which of those wonderful options are, are you going to commit to? Well, one thing I'm pretty happy about it was yesterday we passed the furlough bill we were talking about. And hopefully the governor will sign it pretty quick to give local governments the option. Look, if, if, if Governor Murphy chooses not to, if Governor Murphy chooses not to take advantage of the furlough program, I can tell you, we've talked to school districts, towns, counties that absolutely are looking towards trying to get into that furlough program. David, uh, look, we're going to have to look at borrowing. But my point is, if we're going to borrow, when you borrow, you got to pay it back. I want to know how we're going to pay it back, what we're going to pay it back. And oh, by the way, when we go and borrow money, we're going to get a downgrading, at least one, if not more. And that's going to put us, we'll be the second state in the country with a B rating, you know, B bond rating. And that that's heartbreaking. But at one point, the state had a AAA bond rating. And what that means is like, you know, it's your credit score. If, if you have a really low credit score, you, you try and get a, a loan, you're going to pay a higher interest rate. Yeah, David, you know, I actually, I've actually suggested that if we do have to borrow money from governments, we look at county governments like Essex that has a AAA bond rating and go through them to try to reduce the cost of borrowing. Then the state pay them back, you know, and, you know, because Look, we, we, we got to find we got to find ways to prevent us from getting another downgrade. But that's just you're, you're paying more and getting less. One of the questions here, uh, I guess you kind of touched on it was uh, why did you come out immediately against the borrowing plan that the governor announced? I didn't come out against it at all. I, what I said was I need to know what I'm doing. I need to know how much I'm going to borrow. David, so when you ask me a question, and you say, why did you borrow $5 billion? I said, because that's what the governor told me I needed to borrow. Well, how did, how, what, what did he show you? Nothing. Well, what's he going to go for? I don't know. Remember the Abbott and Costello one? Who's on first? Yeah. Well, that's where we were headed with this. David, I'm open to borrowing. I'm open to borrowing, but I need to know where I'm going. I need to know, are we borrowing the right amount of money? And listen, and it's a guess. So you can't hold the administration if they're off by a little bit. But guess what? I want to know where I'm going, what taxes I'm raising. Because when you do a general obligation bond, David, the first tax that's listed on a general obligation bond is sales tax. And do we want to raise sales taxes on, on people at this time? You know, and you know, you're talking about people that are out of out of work. We're going to increase sales tax. And I'm not talking about seven percent. I'm talking about if you're talking to billions of dollars of talking, you're talking you know, what, eight, nine percent. Did you run that idea by him, the one you had about uh, borrowing through the, the counties? I, I mentioned it. I mentioned it. I mentioned it. That's something that I with Essex County when they borrowed money for their uh, lead water, water. water problem. Yeah. And, you know, David, our counties have triple A and double A bond ratings where we have a real low bond rating. So why wouldn't we utilize if we could? borrow as much out from these counties as we can and pay the counties back. So uh, explain really quickly, if you can, in like 30 seconds, what your furlough bill is about. Furlough bill 
takes advantage of the CARE Act that the feds passed with the extra money. So I'll give you an example. Tom's River laid off 200, furloughed 200 workers and 130 part-time workers. Well, Tom's River is paying 60% of the cost of carrying that furloughed worker. Under my plan, they pay 40%. So you would get a worker. They're going to work so many hours, so many days a week. They're actually going to make more money because the CARE Act provides that additional benefit. So someone making less than $30,000 in a couple of months would be making $5,000 more. It's a good bill, David. It gives towns options and holds, and holds employees harmless. And, and again, I really hope the governor moves to sign it quickly. Anything you hear back from him on that yet? That, you know, mixed signals, open to it. We're concerned we need every employee we have. Yeah. You know, because, you know, we're saying send more people to, well, listen, send more people to unemployment. It's a crisis. You know, the commissioner, and again, commissioner is doing a great job, but he's, he only can do with what he has. And a 40 year, you know, computer system, 40 year old computer system. You know, every, every time people say, ah, you know, we'll let it for the next guy. Well, we found out what happens when you leave to the next one. Do you think the governor went far enough on his reopening of business? A lot of folks who uh, these so-called non-essential retail, uh, they say that, you know, it doesn't really work for them for people to uh, pick up stuff curbside. A lot of their business is about people coming into the shop and, you know, point of purchase sales and looking around the shop. I think of antique shops um, down the shore, particularly. Um, how do you fix that? I mean, can you, do you see a, a way for those places to reopen, to have people physically in their shops? Yeah, it's called CDC guidelines, David. Almost, they give them for everything. And one thing we know, you need six feet apart. So a store owner can say, listen, if it's a real small store, only a couple of you in the store at a time, people stay outside six feet. You know, if you want to do curbside, I can deliver the curbside. You know, I can get that, that value too. But no, there's guidelines that can be given to let people start operating. David, I go into a grocery store. I go into a, a pharmacy. I go into a liquor store. You know what I mean? I've been doing it since this has happened. Why can't we go into these other stores as long as you keep that distancing? Think about this. You have clothing stores, like card stores, they're closed. But you could go to a Walmart or a Target and buy clothes. You can buy cards. You can buy everything. So when you have these, and oh, by the way, those stores are pretty crowded. So when you have these small businesses saying, hey, wait a minute, what about me? Why won't you let me open up? They're not wrong, David. They're not wrong. The, the governor says that if we see a spike in new infections, uh, hospitalizations, et cetera, that he will close down the park, the state parks again, close the beaches again, uh, put back restrictions on business. You're in agreement with him on that, yes? Yeah, I just don't want him to overreact quickly. We got to measure it and make sure that we just don't automatically shut it down again, because there could be a little spike. There could be a, a little bit up before it goes down. We don't know that, David, but you know something? We can't live this way, waiting for the second wave and thinking that by March of next year, we'll be okay, because there won't be an economy to go back to. You mentioned that 50%, over 50% of the deaths in the state are from these long-term care uh, facilities. Some people who have been pushing the governor uh, to be uh, more, more progressive in terms of opening up uh, the state's economy, they point to that as a rationale for reopening the state. I guess their point is that, look, 50% of the deaths are people who are not really participating in this economy. Are you one of those people who, who would agree that there's an acceptable number of deaths? No, you shouldn't, we shouldn't accept any. But David, realize when we have the flu, we lose, they said anywhere from 20 to 80,000 people a year in the country with the regular flu. I'm not even thinking, I'm not even coming close to comparing this to the flu because it's so much more aggressive. But what, what's happening, David, I have a brother who runs an emergency, he's the head of emergency medicine in one of the hospitals here. They, they're figuring it out now. They're figuring out how to treat people. You know, if this was just a rush, we didn't know much about it. You know, were we putting people in ventilators too soon? Possibly. 
Now you have Revesivir or whatever that they think can shorten and help people. So we're starting to figure it out. We got overwhelmed. And this is where the governor did a very good job. He brought that curve down. And now our healthcare systems are in a position where they can treat. Although, David, one of the big problems still is the PPE. Not acceptable. Not enough. Telling nurses and doctors they got to wear it all day long when they're around. You know, like when this first happened, my brother actually went to a hardware store and had to get goggles because there was no face shields. I'm in construction. We got them for construction respirators. You know, them big things with the canisters. Yeah. All right. We are uh, running out of time. So I have a, a bunch of questions here. This is kind of a rapid fire uh, segment. So short answers, if you could, Senator. Um, here's from Linda in the chat box. Uh, how is state government preparing for a possible opening of schools in September? I know this can't be a real quick question, but I mean, that's a consideration, right? Senator Ruiz, Tressa Ruiz, is heading up a committee as we speak and has for the last month on just what she talked about, trying to figure it out with educational experts. I did a piece this week about how um, uh, doctors are seeing kids, young kids particularly, acting out more and regressing uh, because they don't have that, that same kind of interaction at school yeah. that they had before. Somebody said, how do you keep two-year-olds away from each other? I mean, two second graders away from each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, these briefings that the governor does every uh, every day, uh, are, are they effective? Or is, as some have suggested, particularly on on from the other party, that he's using them for politics? He has had some uh, Congress people, Democrats on. He had Menendez on the other day. Is, is he kind of taking advantage of that to, to move his uh, democratic agenda? I don't think so, because th those briefings aren't going to promote any congressman or senator. You know, I mean, it's they're not getting any bounce from that in appearance of the briefing. They're, they're not getting any benefit at all from that. Should the governor um, allow for graduations now? Yeah, I do think so, David. Done safely, properly, six feet distancing. You saw the Air Force Academy with, with Vice President Pence. I got all the superintendents down here in Gloucester County saying they want to do, you know, no, no parents in the stands, but stream it, keep the kids six feet apart and, and, uh, and do it safely. And if, and look, and it's different where you're at in Newark, they would have to do it multiple days, you know what I mean? Because there's so many kids, but you know, it's a shame that a lot of these young people aren't getting the opportunity because you know, social distancing to be had, you can do it. So in your mind, you'd have a graduation ceremony, but you would stream it and parents would not necessarily be in the audience, but the kids would be able to walk up and get a diploma. And get the diploma because, you know, that's, you're only going to get to do that once graduating from high school. You don't get it to get a second chance. And if it was impossible to do, I'd say, I, I would agree, but I, I Look, we got football fields every six feet all the way around. You know, take a little bit longer, but we can do it safely. Republicans have asked for hearings into how the governor and his administration have handled the COVID-19 crisis. How likely is are those hearings to happen? Listen, there'll, there'll, be, a, there'll be a post op on this, David. You know, and if there needs to be hearings, there will be. Listen, uh, we're going to be holding a couple of hearings on nursing. We're going to be holding hearings on nursing homes, and we're going to hear them on jails with, with nursing homes and the, uh, the institutions and group homes and jail. So, but if there's if there's a need to go beyond after we've looked at things and we really do, really we go and what you do after something like this, you say what did we do good, what did we do bad, and if there's a need to do hearings, we're, we'll do them. After, yeah. Not during. No. no. Well, no, no, David, we are going to be doing some hearings now. We are going to be doing some hearings now. In fact, Senator Sarlo is holding hearings with that working group that we have Monday on how, how we have hospital CEOs telling them how they can open up and how they can make things safe and urging people to go back into the emergency rooms. And we're going to be doing other hearings, like I said, on the jails and on the nursing homes. Let me ask you quick about the jails that the governor said he was going to release about a thousand people, uh, you know, low risk inmates. Um, that was about a month ago, I think, was was when he made that announcement. 
He's fallen way short of that. I don't have the number in front of me, but it's less than half of that, I think. Uh, do they need to get on the ball about that? 40 well, you know, you like know the, that, that's a catch-22 for him, David, because here's one of the problems. The prosecutors had to review who they were going to release. So, the, you know, a lot of the prosecutors weren't anxious to see certain people out of jail. So, you know, you can't hang that all on him because you have people in law enforcement saying, whoa, not that guy, not that gal. Should masks be mandatory in public? Boy, man, that's a hard one. I think for your own sake, you should wear them. David, I think, I think personally, like when I go outside, I'm wearing it, you know, because I want to protect the person see coming at me and I want to protect myself. You didn't answer the question, though. <laughs> well, I, listen, I, you know, I, I told my son this. I'm incensed. They say six feet. You know, David, sometimes people have lapses in judgment. I had a, I had a guy knock on my window of my car, and he had his mask in his hand and wanted me to put my window down. And I, and I said to him, back up, back up. And I put my window down and I talked to him. So do I think it should be mandatory? No. But do I think I, I agree with the governor strongly suggest if you're going to be around other people, you should? Yes. People should be doing it more. Yes. So I guess we got we to gotta make masks hip again. Well, there's, they're making all kinds of designs now. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, what's the status of your path to progress? Well, I think people are going to have to start looking at some of that stuff now, David. You know, we might have been ahead of our time. Because, you know, rather than let local governments borrow and school districts borrow, maybe they should be doing more shared services. Maybe there should be school consolidations. Now, before we go back and start squeezing the taxpayers, maybe we got to squeeze ourselves first. Is it time to reconsider uh, some of those tax incentives that the EDA passed? We're waiting to finalize that. This happened, David, and this took this took focus off of everything else, as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so once 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 this calms down, hopefully the governor and myself and the speaker can come to an agreement. All right, Senator uh, Sweeney, thanks a lot for doing this, man. We appreciate your time. I appreciate it. And I appreciate watching you drinking the vodka while I was doing it. <laughs> Here's to you then. <laughs> thanks a lot. Stay safe out there, man. Thank you. You too. See you, David. Folks, um, Chatbox is a production of NJTV News. Our executive producer is Jamie Kraft. You know, it's funny because I call Jamie, Jamie Kraft every day. But when I have to tell you who our executive producer is, it goes out of my mind. That's why I wrote it down. Jamie Kraft is our executive producer. Our uh, producer is Lindsay Raspin. And our director tonight is Elvin Badger. Um, over at the chat box, Tim Nostrin is your moderator. Uh, just a programming note. Next week, our guest is Declan O'Scanlan, the Republican state senator and we have the return of Reporters Roundtable. Both of those will be live starting at 6.30 next Thursday. So we hope you join us. A special thank you to all of you who have been in the chat box tonight sending us your questions. We appreciate your participation in this program. I'm David Cruz. For all of us at NJTV News, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next week.